Uh, hi everyone, so I'm Saikib, I'm a graduate student uh, at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, I'm going to talk about an initiative that uh, I and a few other MIT students we have started in Bangladesh. Uh, it has been going on for the last winter and this summer and we plan to continue uh, with more MIT students in the initiative. So before I get into my talk, uh, I'll just show you a quick video of what we have been doing and I'm kind of uh, going to fly over it. Like we, I have very short time, but uh, you'll get an idea what's happening. So, uh, what you're seeing is the final project that came out of a one-week workshop with students. Uh, we selected students from uh, uh, from the whole country. There were 400 plus applications, and we selected 60 students to work with us, a few MIT students, and uh, we taught them interdisciplinary thinking. Uh, design, uh, hardware, and also technical product management. Uh, so the outcome of these were final projects that they worked on for two or three days, and uh, these are just some glimpses of some projects. Uh, probably you won't understand the language. Uh, it's the video is still in the uh, in processing. So uh, I'm just going to go through some projects. So this project is basically it's a uh, sonar scanner, so it scans the whole room for people who are visually impaired. It scans the whole room for them using ultrasonic waves and uh, they make a map of this and uh, they create a sonic signal. Just so based on the sound you can actually understand how the room looks like. Uh, this was done uh, as a, uh, this group basically did a project to fight uh, eat teasing in Bangladesh and basically what they were doing is from security camera clips, if you see uh, suspicious activities, they will just record all the faces in the, uh, uh, they'll do some face recognition and they will record the faces in a database. Um, <clears throat> these guys uh, made this uh, prototype where uh, you could actually detect hand gesture using very simple uh, ultrasonic sound sensor and uh, based on that, based on some certain patterns, you can actually understand the American Sign Language. So it, it is basically made for people because uh, many of us, uh, we don't know how to read sign language, but if someone is showing us a sign language and we translate it to some uh, speech, then we can actually hear. So it's, it's like one layer more to the sign language just so it's easier for people to understand, uh, people who can't speak. Uh, so just a few projects like that. This was uh, this was an augmented reality project, a game uh, developed for children, where you could turn any any surface into an interactive surface, like a touch screen, right? Uh, so if you project on the wall, you can turn the uh, wall into a touch screen, and they made an educational game out of this for children. So there are many projects like that, and. Uh, I will get into my talk uh, instead of showing all the projects, but uh, in general, I started with this because you might wonder, there is already engineering curriculum in our country. There are people are already learning a lot of stuff. Why should we actually go and teach them, like let's say what we do in MIT Media Lab or like mechanical engineering or whoever, whatever the students are uh, learning, they kind of go from MIT and like share this with Bangladeshi students. Why should we do that? Uh, I will... Hold on. Okay. And... Uh, so... Uh, I'm gonna talk for some time about why I think this is important, uh, why this initiative is important, very important, and it's very relevant for our time. Uh, all of us are thinking about technology and science and innovation and how can we actually teach these things to the local community in Bangladesh just so they can come up with their own solutions to local community problems, right? And how do we actually build these engineers or scientists? So I was reading this uh, in some book and I really like this quote. Darwin disliked school and was quite content to be a me mediocre student at the university. Yet he was also deeply committed to self-education through extensive reading, scientific explorations of the countryside, and conversations with established scientists. So if we look at the three 
key words over here. People who are good scientists, people who are good engineers, they do a lot of self-education. It's much less about what you learn in classes. It's, much, it's more about if you're given a problem, you have to teach yourself a lot of new things. How you learn those new things and solve the problem. And then you have to explore, right? And explore, I'll talk, about, uh, talk more about this, what exploration means in this context. And then you have to converse with established scientists or people who already have ideas about these things. People have, who already have made a lot of mistakes and you want to learn from them, right? So I'm going to start by uh, just talking about myself because I think I can relate very well to myself. That makes sense, right? So, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to tell you like, so I, I ended up in Media Lab, MIT Media Lab, and uh, it wasn't really something that I expected when I was a kid, right? And uh, but I really wanted to do a lot of stuff. I wanted to build stuff, and I wanted to do research. And uh, but I was in Bangladesh at the same time, right? And uh, what problems did I face? And some of these problems are still faced by students. So I, I think I can relate very well to these students. So let's talk about self-education. Uh, we go to school and we learn just math, English, and all these lessons, right? But then we want to do something more in our, like when we're in school, we want to like make st cool stuff. So most of the times we don't have resources in our hand and uh, uh, we have to self-educate to ourselves, right? My self-education with computers started uh, with this magazine called Computer Jagat. It was like an old magazine and uh, they would put up code snippets like, uh, like in C language or QSIC language. And I would not understand a single line of those code, but I would just stare at that. I, I thought it's beautiful, right? Uh, just the code. And I thought, oh, it, it looks so cool. I want to do that. I want to write that. What does that mean? So I asked my parents to buy me a computer. I didn't even have a computer at that time. And uh, it was like 99 or 2000, 1999 or 2000, around that time. I was in sixth or seventh grade. And uh, my parents were uh, concerned because so many homes, like many houses, didn't have computers with them at that time. And my uncles and aunts, they were giving ideas to my parents that, oh, if a computer comes, there are many problems with the computers, right? So with these kids, and like, I mean, these kids these days, oh gosh, man. You shouldn't give them computers, right? And I even had the idea, like, I mean, one of my uncles uh, had the idea that if a computer virus spreads, it's actually airborne. You have to kind of, you know, you have to kind of cover your computer and, uh, like, and it's, a, it's a big hassle, don't buy a computer. You know? Uh, and then you become a game addict. Your son will always play games. Like, all he will do is play games. He'll do nothing else. So, uh, my parents went ahead and bought me a computer. And the first thing I did was <laughs> install Road Rash and quit. <laughs> right? So, uh, whatever the prediction. And uh, if you guys remember Road Rash, it was a very nice game, right? <laughs> Yeah, and uh, but after playing for some time, I started thinking that I want to make these games. I mean, uh, I just don't want to play it. I want to build that virtual world. And uh, I don't know how many of you know John Carmack. He started the first-person shooter game genre. He developed a lot of computer graphics algorithms. He was a dropout, by the way, from university, but I mean, he uh, contributed a lot in computer graphics research. And. I read up about him. I saw him on TV, like in some uh, game show or something, and then uh, I became very interested. And I, I thought, like, okay, I want to become like John Carmack. What did he do actually in his life? And uh, he started coding, right? I mean, he said, everyone starts coding very early, like uh, when they do these things. So I said, okay, I'm gonna teach myself coding. And this was back in seventh grade. I got a C language, C programming language book. It was written in Bangla. And I, st I read the instructions, like, I mean, I have to write these lines, right? And I wrote my very first Hello World program. But then there was a problem. The problem is the, I mean, I don't know how many of you are familiar with programming languages, but there are compilation errors, right? I mean, if you do something wrong, then you have to debug it. And then comes the challenge that I don't have any resources in my hand to debug this program. 
I do have cyber cafes where I could go and look up what this message means, but I was not smart enough at that time to think that I could actually look up in Google and Google will give me an answer. There is limited internet access also. There is language barrier. I wasn't very good in English at that time. And then there is school homeworks, you know, being pounded on me, like all that time I have to do good, I have to like do good in the class and all of that. And if I mess up in my class, then my parents are gonna, you know, they sell the computer. That's a big problem. Uh, <laughs> so what happens? I tried for three months. I just tried that single, just four or five lines of code. I tried random code, I even changed the small semicolons. I thought probably if I put uh, one more carriage return or enter, like one, one space, it will work and all of that. I tried hacking, I changed all the directories where my program was, nothing was working. And I knew that if I wanted to write games, I have to write thousands of lines of code. This was just four or five lines. And I was losing hope that, I mean, what should I do now? I mean, probably I can become all that, you know, like it's, it's I, I'm gonna give up, right? And then Java, the programming language, came to rescue in some way, like in a, in a very weird way. There was this Java, free Java workshop being offered to university students and I sneaked in over there. And I went and talked to the instructor. Hey, I wrote this Hello World program. I was like, oh, hey, ha, yeah. <laughs> right? So, so, but then I said, uh, hey, this, but it doesn't work. Uh, what should I do? So he told me that you just need to tell it where these linker files are. It's not even finding where your code is, so I mean, you have to tell it where to find all these other files. So, it's so easy, right? Okay, so I went back and I ran my first Hello World program, right? And uh, it was the best experience ever. It's just one line being output from my program, but it took me three months to get there, right? And this is a problem many students still face. They still have internet. But sometimes, which I'm going to talk about later, sometimes you need a little bit of guidance to get there. The same with electronics. I bought all these, you know, like circuit diagram books and I would like go to all these uh, stores where they would sell all these electronic components. And the uh, shop owner would say, this IC, you can't even find it. Like, you know, people are putting this up in their books just for, you know, some, some fancy circuit. You don't even know what this company this IC is from. I'm like, okay, sure, probably I should stop doing electronics. And that's where my electronics and they were ended. <laughs> but I didn't uh, end with programming, right? I went ahead and uh, bought these uh, game programming books from India. Like, I ordered them. And uh, I started making actual games, like what I really wanted to do. And it was, this was back in eighth grade. I, so this is basically a full 3D model of our school building. I and a few friends, a few friends basically made the 3D model and I, I coded it. And we had this, so I became John Carmack to some extent that I had my own first person shooter. And that was very empowering. We went ahead and we created this uh, digital magazine. Uh, at that time it was something of a new idea that you have paper magazine, but what if you make interactive animations and show this through an interactive interface and sell it as a CD. So we were like very, these kid entrepreneurs, you know, like back in eighth grade. And we made this and we sold it to a few schools and like we, we earned a few thousand taka and like we went to some restaurant and ate, you know. <laughs> that, that was our first entrepreneurship experience, right? Yeah, so uh, all of this was possible because I self-educated myself, but self-education is hard but it's much, much harder to start the process. So if I gave up for that three or four lines of code in that three months, and if there was no one to tell me that, hey, it's a very simple thing, you can do it, and you just need to go and just change this one thing, right? So sometimes all you need is a little hope, just a little bit of guidance. Most people are very self-driven, but they need a little bit of guidance. So first thing gone, let's talk about the exploration part. Uh, we have three mediums of education in Bangladesh. So there is Bangladesh medium, English medium, and Islamic slash Arabic, uh, three mediums. And given the na nature of our culture, uh, or in my family culture, I ended up exploring all three at different times. And it, it's a very interesting story, but I'm not gonna get into that. But what that taught me, excuse me, 
So I had this Bangla medium friend and I had this English medium friend and they started uh, debating between themselves. They saw this picture and they're saying, one person is saying this is Agniyogiri and then the other person is saying this is Vulcan. You know, so you're not right. So basically what this means is, uh, and, but Agniyogiri is the meaning of, uh, like the Bengali of Vulcan, right? And they're not agreeing, right? And that small event kind of tells you how clusters are being formed and people probably misunderstand each other in small things and th that might magnify to big things. And the thing about Islamic or Arabic uh, education system, if you read the science books, you see that they only talk about miracles of water and honey because apparently in the Quran, uh, these are the two things that are most talked about, you know, the miracles of water and the miracles of honeybees. And you will see like all of these, and it's funny like how you see all this curriculum of uh, the Islamic or Arabic medium being uh, kind of devoted to those themes. They'll teach you everything about the, about water. It's H2O, the, all the bonding structure and everything, followed by a verse from the Quran, what it says about uh, water, right? And the same thing about honey. So, <clears throat> what this creates is a group of people, like I mean, three groups of different people, it forms clusters, sometimes it forms confusion, and it forms versus debates, like I mean, who is better and all of that. Right? And exploration is really necessary in this case. Because I think the true compassion for someone else grows only when you wear that other person's shoes. If you're not going to an Arabic medium, we might be laughing at them for actually having this you know, funny syllabus. But someone who don't have any other access to other kinds of education, and he's going there to get whatever is available to them, if I go there only, I will understand how frustrating this thing is, you know. People around me are like learning a lot and I know for sure that I won't get a good job because my education is, you know, uh, done. Uh, that's one good thing about exploration. Second thing about exploration is, uh, so I, 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 I'm going to take a detour, a uh, little bit of detour. Uh, after I did all that computer games and all that, in my high school I started getting into more into physics, astrophysics and that sort of stuff. And there would be all these Bengali books, like popular science books, and I would just buy them and, you know, read them and, like, get really excited. Uh, then I ended up, like, uh, going through a lot of uh, uh, different subjects in my uh, college when I came to USA. Uh, and then I got a master's in applied math and then, then I came to Media Lab. And uh, I worked in different research labs, cognitive science, particle physics, and blah, 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 a lot of the things. And then I had experience with liberal arts, and at the same time, science and technology, like uh, what people say, like very tech heavy schools, right? One thing that I noticed uh, is that some sort of discrimination still goes on, even between, so the same thing that we see in Bangladesh, similar kind of things go on in USA in the sense that People make fun of liberal arts, that, oh, they, they can't do science, you know? So this is from XKCD. If you actually look at uh, one of their, uh, what do you call that, like uh, corporate line or whatever, like they say the last sentence, it's not suitable, advanced mathematics is not suitable for liberal arts majors. Uh, whereas I was an applied math uh, master's, like I went ahead and got an applied, applied math master's and I was a math major, uh, was a math minor in uh, college. So, today's engineers are mostly engineers. Why does this happen? Because today's engineers are mostly engineers and artists are mostly artists. That wasn't the case, even like if you see 1000 years ago. If you look at the Arab scientists, you'll see that they were scientists, but at the same time they were probably musicians. They were basically polymer, they could do a few things together. But in today's world, we have focused everyone in such a narrow way that we don't have that idea of exploration at all. And we don't have that compassion coming because of that. And we need the compassion because that compassion and empathy yield respect for others. And when you have respect, you, have, you can have good effective collaboration. Otherwise, you can't work in a good, like, work well in a team. And this compassion will only come through exploration, right? And third point, exploration often leads to meaningful and life-changing conversations. I'm not going to get into that, but... Uh, I had the privilege to talk to very good professors who had a lot of effect on me and like they gave me very good advices. So if I just 
put all of this together, then I'm going to start talking about why I started Kalpa Kushal. And so, sorry for the long that drive over here, but I think this was very important because it's very really important to know what is the goal of or what are we trying to do exactly. So we need self-education. We need someone who can give us a little bit of guidance. Uh, we need to explore, definitely. Or people need to explore. All these students need to explore. And they need to have conversations with people who have already done those mistakes so that they don't repeat the mistakes. Things have changed a little bit from my time. Now they have computers, they have internet, they have resources in, in English which not necessarily doesn't help everyone all the time, right? I mean, if you're going to some uh, like uh, village site, then the English resources don't really help. And then they have self self help groups, which I think is very good, like in terms of like uh, you have friends and you're getting together to study. And what they need is what Kalpagoshal is trying to do. Uh, they need conversations. They want to get small tips, just so everyone has some dream project idea. What is that dream project? So every time you wake up in the morning and you're looking at the ceiling and like you're thinking about uh, all these you know, weird stuff, everything, and then you come up with all these weird ideas. Everyone has these kind of ideas, right? I mean, they, they occur to you and you want to make them. And sometimes you just don't have the right guidance. Probably you just need one person to consult for five minutes. Then you'll be able to build it, right? Uh, they need exploratory mindset. Everyone in a computer science classroom in Buet, or like I mean in the big good engineering universities in Bangladesh, everyone builds a line follower robot in a robotics class. I mean, come on, man. I mean, if everyone is building a line follower robot, it's good, you'll get a good grade, but I mean, you're not understanding what other applications this line follower robot could have, right? And then they need resources in Bangla. And they need self-help groups that has the above mindset, like this exploratory mindset, and they want to converse with people around them. And what does Kalpa Koshal provide? They provide, uh, we provide a way to uh, engage with MIT students and alumni. We talk about how we achieved our goals, we try to inspire them, right? And uh, they explore, how do they explore? We get different people together, we recruit business, uh, business students, economic students, along with uh, engineering and science students. And we put them in the same group and we ask them to kind of work together to come up with the final project. The business guy makes a business proposal and the engineering guy makes the prototype. And uh, self-help groups, this is really important because we just go for a week over there, right? And then what happens? We just leave and what do they do? We need to create a platform for them just so they can continue doing this, right? So this army that you create, even like with 60 students or 70 students, they'll go around and they'll spread the word, which is very important. I'll give some, uh, before I give some examples, uh, last summer, so I started this alone back in January with some help from local sponsor. And then this last summer, we went with uh, four MIT students slash alumni. So Esan Hawk, who is an MIT Media Lab graduate, he's like uh, an assistant professor in University of Rochester, then Urmi, who is a student, a senior at mechanical engineering at MIT. Shami, who was uh, MIT material science, or uh, environmental engineering, and me. So four of us went, we spent time with these students, seven days straight, very intense workshop. We started at nine, we let them go at five or six. And uh, there were 400 plus applications, 60 were chosen, we taught them Things that are not line follower robots, which means things that are sort of new to them. So augmented reality, virtual reality, data visualization, speech analysis, hardware and design thinking. And uh, you can see some projects over uh, on the side. So I was showing you already some projects. So these guys basically made a gesture recognition, human body gesture recognition. Just so in an ATM, if someone is robbing you and you do a certain gesture without saying anything, then an alarm will go, uh, an alarm will be triggered. Then I, I showed some of these, like the augmented reality stuff, sonar and uh, Kinect stuff. Oh yeah, so, okay, yeah, so probably have seen all this. And I, I really want to iterate about the self-help groups and how we can actually help these people. So, uh, as I said, this army will go and spread your words, but how do they do it? So, this guy, uh, he graduated like uh, one year ago. He uh, was with me back in my uh, January workshop, and then I made him a TA uh, for the summer workshop. 
he went to Jesser, which is uh, uh, another division, a remote place in Bangladesh, and he went to this University of Technology and uh, that University of Technology over there, and he started running this uh, embedded hardware workshop, uh, which he learned from my workshop. Uh, and then these two girls, uh, they worked with, uh, they were with me in January too. They became my TAs in summer, and uh, uh, the, they worked with me on certain projects. I mentored them in the spring semester, like this uh, last spring semester. The girl on the right, she came up with her own paper based on the work that I told her to do. Uh, and uh, like uh, the other girl, she's also working on some paper right now. Uh, these guys, they worked with me, again, they were my students back in January. Uh, the guy on the right, he is a 42-year-old, but I still took him in uh, because he was so interested to actually learn. And uh, the guy on the left, uh, he is just a uh, graduate from university, recent graduate. And uh, recently, after they got together uh, from my workshop in January and uh, became TAs in summer workshop, their recent project was uh, sending the Bangladeshi flag to space. Uh, so, people are very self-driven in general, right? And uh, people are very self-driven and as I say, like these three principles, like uh, you have to self-educate yourself, we want to help over there. How can you self-educate? We want to help those students. Uh, you have to explore and we can teach them how to explore or you can tell them how we have explored so they get some idea and we try to put them together just so we build this platform just so they can st continue doing good work and spread the word and this is where uh, we need help from MIT students we are trying to recruit students uh, uh, we want to teach these kids how to think and dream using technology education and interdisciplinary thinking and uh, we want people, not only from MIT, like wherever you are, if you think uh, you have something to contribute, talk to us, we want to brainstorm ideas, we want to design curriculum. Uh, so far, whatever kind of expertise we come in with, all these four people who went last time, we have a unique set of expertise, but we always uh, welcome other, other expertise, just so we can we do like the curriculum is more uh, it can include more people then we have to do fundraising uh, every time I have to kind of run around you know try, try to raise some funds just for air ticket and like the hardware cost and everything if people can help with that uh, not necessarily by money but also like I mean doing some of the you know like activities to raise some funds and also traveling as a mentor in winter next winter so we are planning again to go during winter uh, if you want to follow up, uh, this, that's my email address, sakib, S-A-Q-U-I-B, at mit.edu. And you can go to the website, kolpokushal.org, K-O-L-P-O-K-O-U-S-H-O-L. It's a little hard to pronounce name, probably will come up with uh, a little better English name on the side, just so it's easier for uh, American people to pronounce, right? Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, thanks for coming. So, uh, if you have any questions, probably we'll uh, answer questions from anyone, if anyone has any questions. Actually, it's for both and the panel. Uh, how did you measure your success and when you have to raise funds, like you mentioned, in both cases? How were you measuring that and making sure that people understand what, how successful it is? So, if I'm being honest for my one, so, if I'm being honest, for my uh, initiative, uh, I cannot define success yet. It's too premature to define success. Uh, we have just done only two workshops, and there is a long way to go, and we need a lot of help from people. Uh, for me, the success would be seeing these kind of projects coming out. So, the, the success stories that I told. Uh, it's not for me. I don't run this organization. People who come in, I tell them, then tell them, Whatever position you want, take it, name yourself anything, I don't care, just contribute, you know. So, I mean, it's not mine, we just want the work to be done. So, as long as these projects are coming out, when we leave, these people get together and, like, do good projects, that's what success for me means. But... Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, 